us in, babe. Welcome to Coco, Coco Caliente. Caliente. Welcome to, this is our, man, we've been doing this for a while. I don't even know what episode we're on. This so. is 40. It doesn't feel like we've done that many, but no, anyways. They're getting funner and funner. Funner and funner. I have a interesting, just quick tidbit, you know, little opener for us today. Because we have so many things going on in our life right now, and it revolves around money, right? Yeah. And so there's two things that really have me stressed out that I just want to air out with you. And I know we've talked about Why it. Why do you do this on the podcast? Because we're real people and we have real problems okay, and real life things. So the one is the vehicle that we're about to buy, right? We need a new vehicle. Yeah. Uh, I have right now, I have like a 2004 Honda Civic stick shift two door. And I have a 2006 Grand Prix GXP that I've had for 10 years. Yeah, and they're both sedans. Hers is four door. Mine mine's only two has, doors. Mine only has like 70,000 miles though. Yours has well, over mine has 200. Like 200 <laughs> and pushing 9,000 miles now. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically what well, what's going on is we live in Michigan and there's snow and so we don't have a snow vehicle right we don't have a nice SUV all wheel drive and then we want to have babies like 3 mm-hmm. or 4 and so what yeah what Nothing. Why what? <laughs> it's not a surprise that we want to have kids one day. I know. Yeah. So anyway, so we want to have kids and we don't have a vehicle for that either. Mm-hmm. And as we're looking at vehicles, they're expensive. And so it's hard for me. I am not the type of person. So there are different types of people out there. Mm-hmm. Um, people who need to have a new vehicle mm-hmm. every couple of years. It's maybe, I don't know why. It could be a status thing. It could be... A lot of people that do that lease vehicles. Okay. Um, But I have never been the person where a nice vehicle defines me. No, neither have I. Hence, and And I bad that car for so that's why we have no shame in our game. Oh, no. I'll pull up. When we roll up, (laughs) like, we're just like, it doesn't define me by what I drive. It doesn't... I love my car. I would still have it if... We didn't have snow and kids coming. You know what I drove to the CMAs? You remember when we went to the Country Music Awards? Yeah. I drove my 2004 yeah. Honda Civic to the CMAs. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't pull up on the red carpet or anything, but that's what I drove. And I don't care, right? I save, I don't have any payments on that car, yeah. right? I just upkeep it well, and everything. Well, the reason I bring it up is because I do know people from this area yeah. specifically that will get a new truck every two years. They don't care that they lose thousands and thousands of dollars just by driving it off the lot mm-hmm. and then tearing it up for two years and it's not a lease they buy and they sell yeah and um i just was always in awe of how why how are you wasting ten thousand dollars twenty thousand yeah. dollars just just because you want like the new truck mm-hmm. so not for people who lease or whatever um this is more for people who just like need that new this will be our first new vehicle ever for yeah. both of us. And, and for us, we want to spend like, I don't know how much I want to spend, but it's looking like it's going to be around 40 or more thousand. Mm. And it's like, that's expensive. And sometimes it's hard for me to rationalize that, but we also want this vehicle to be long term, right? We want to get it. We'll use it for 20 years. Don't new worry. <laughs> or as close to new as possible, but we're going to run it until we can't run it anymore. We're not going to switch out, right? All right. So, and that brings me to wow, we're spending that much on such a long term investment, mm-hmm. right? And then when we start talking about wedding plans, oh yeah, yeah, that it's like it's for one day. It's, it's more for, than that. For it's going to be more than that mm-hmm. for one day. And I have this argument in my head back and forth, and sometimes with Nicole about how necessary are the expenditures that we're making for flowers or a DJ or I the just food. didn't know that things are okay. So. Just ex- just flowers are expensive. I didn't realize how expensive. Like I didn't realize ten thousand dollars on flowers is like minimum. That and that's in, and that's insane to me. That- but we could import all of our flowers probably and make our own things. And I think people do do that. But it's just the work that goes behind that is like the hidden cost. I think. Putting on weddings is, yeah, and setting up your own wedding can be stressful. And also having your bridesmaids like. Be tight. I had to set up some weddings. Having them work. Yeah. yeah, Having them work the day. Like Mm -hmm. it's a catch 22. And for me, like, and I'll, and I'll go back and forth with Nicole because then I'll be like, man, this is so expensive. I can't believe. But then it's like, 
all right, you pay this much and you're taking the workload off of yourself. Because we just and recently it's be decided to get a, planner, a wedding planner, yeah. which I never thought I would have because I'm like, I can do it myself. I can't put more money. I don't have the money to spend on a planner. It's not in the budget. And, and I, they're like, no, we'll save you that money. And I'm like, are you really going to though? But hey, we're going to try it. They and seem I will great. Say, I will say this. Mm-hmm. The study was done on happiness, yeah. right? And money doesn't necessarily buy happiness. But what they were saying is people that spend their money on things that save them time makes them happier. Mm-hmm. In fact, for example, people that pay uh, for landscaping and gardening services, people that pay for people to come clean their house, people that pay mm-hmm. – like if you spend your money on those things and then you're saving yourself time mm-hmm. because you're not spending that time, right? That makes you happier. That Opposed to buying material things that you think are going to make you happy. Like when, when they say like, oh, I'm going to go buy on – we're going to go on this vacation and I yeah. expect this, this, and this to happen on that vacation. Yeah. And then you go there and you might not hit that criteria. Then that memory is not the same for you anymore. Opposed to just having a broad generalized, like, That's smart, I'm going to yeah. have fun when I go. And then you do have fun. You might not hit all the check boxes that you might have if you preset those, yeah. but you still had a good time. It's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. you know. No, that makes sense because yeah. people think like... Okay, I'm not going to spend money. Uh, I can do my own garden. I can yes. do my own lawn. Mm-hmm. But really, um, maybe if you bought less plants, spent money on plants, and had someone tend them, I mean, mine would be living more. I yeah, think. And, and you would have that time. Like a lot of times, what happens to people the weekend comes, like, oh my god, I got to do the lawn. I got to clean the house. I got to take, you know, I got to whatever. I got to do X, Y, and Z this weekend. Mm-hmm. I have no time. I'm stressed. Right. Opposed to being like, I can do the things that I want to do now, like hobby stuff. And I don't have to do like the chore stuff. Yeah. I mean, I totally, I get that. That's really interesting point, Victor. And also like as far as, I mean, I wish I could hire a chef, a cleaning person. Yeah. And then there's like, really, there's no way. Like I, some days I literally do not eat anything but junk or what's in <laughs> chips, cookies. Because you don't have time. Because I don't have time. Yeah, so that brings me back to the wedding stuff. So sometimes I, I'll be able to rationalize things like the wedding planner. Wow, you know, you just saved yourself so much time, right? Or so even much with the headache. flowers, mm-hmm. not importing them and setting them up yourself. You're not burdening your bridesmaids and yourself and your parents and stuff to go set that stuff up. And then up. like worrying from now until they come in if they're going to look good. <laughs> exactly. That's not on your shoulders <laughs> yeah. anymore, you know? So I can see that. And I also see that I see this as a big family reunion, right? So mm-hmm. every time I start thinking about all oh, the price and everything, when was the last time that I got to see all my family in one place? And then now your family is going to meet my family yeah, for exactly. the first time all in one place. And it's going to be the special event. We're just basically throwing an awesome party. An awesome family reunion party. Yeah, just for, we want our guests to, we, it's really for our guests to have a great time. Yeah. And, and then mean, for us, us to not be stressed and be happily in love and married, you know? Yeah. So that that's the battle that I have internally and and it's like all right it's relatable the the cost is inevitable at this point mm-hmm. just go with it and I still struggle with it sometimes cuz it is a lot of money but I do what I can uh and speaking of that that I, I think that all comes into health right yeah internal health right mm-hmm. and being feeling better about what we're doing and we have a special guest today all right Dr. Stephen Gundry. I'm pretty psyched because I found out he was on Dak Shepard's podcast. So I feel like basically I'm on, he's, I don't know, we're the, we're the same. And the funny thing is when we, when Nicole set this guest up, cause she knows I like to speak to people like this, right? Yeah. Like experts. And I just so happened to have listened to Dak's podcast with, uh, with, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Gundry mm-hmm. and I, uh, I didn't want to listen to it again because I had listened to it a little while ago because I didn't want to like regurgitate mm-hmm. what they were saying, but I remember really enjoying that podcast. So I was like, okay. oh, this is going to be awesome. So we really hope you guys enjoy. Welcome, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll, we'll just uh, jump right into it. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll just kind of go from there where it all started with you. No. Okay. Um, well, I, uh, have a illustrious history, I guess, very, uh, world famous heart surgeon, uh, pioneered, uh, infant and baby heart transplantation with my partner, Leonard Bailey, uh, chairman of the department of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda for many, many years. Um, 20 years ago, 
I met a gentleman with inoperable coronary artery disease who in six months' time, by following a, a diet very similar to what I prescribe now and taking a bunch of supplements from a health food store, cleaned out his coronary artery wow. blockages in wow. six months. Wow. And I was so impressed with that that uh, I decided to try it on myself because uh, I was uh, running 30 miles a week, going to the gym one hour a day, eating a healthy, low-fat vegetarian diet, and mm-hmm. I was 70 pounds overweight, arthritis, migraines, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes, you name it, I had it. Everything. <laughs> I was doing everything right. And <laughs> I, was, I was told it was genetics, and uh, it wasn't. So I... Um, I changed my uh, diet and lost 50 pounds my first year and subsequently another 20, and I've kept it off for 20 years. And I started teaching uh, the patients that I operated on uh, this program in the hopes that uh, they would stay away from me in the future, not have a reoperation. <laughs> and uh, after about a year of doing this and seeing the results of their my blood pressure going away, their diabetes going away, uh, I actually one morning uh, said, well, got, I've got this all wrong. I shouldn't operate on them and then teach them how to eat. I should teach them how to eat first, mm-hmm. and then I won't have to operate on them in the first place. Um, now, as a heart surgeon, that's really dumb. Yeah. Money-wise, <laughs> yeah. Because you're, you're putting yourself out of business. But mm. anyhow, I resigned my position at Loma Linda and uh, – set up a clinic in Palm Springs, and every three months I ask people to let me take about, oh, 20 tubes of blood out of them and send it to labs around the country that Medicare insurance would pay for and ask them to make changes in their diet and send them to Costco or Trader Joe's for uh, supplements. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, uh, it worked. And that actually you know, has resulted in four New York Times best-selling books. The most famous, of course, is The Plant Paradox. Yep. And um, that's uh, – so I still – I see patients uh, every day. Uh, actually, after I get off the phone with you, I will see a full load of patients today in my mm-hmm. office in Santa Barbara on Sunday. And I still see patients every day in Palm Springs. And my patients uh, teach me uh, what uh, the effect of certain foods are, taking foods away, putting foods in, and what supplements. So, I don't know, one of the few people in this space that actually base what I have to say on actual patient results. Yeah, yeah and, and so for me that's interesting because Nicole and I have very different diets. Mm-hmm. Nicole is very plant-based mm-hmm. and I eat all the meat under the sun. I don't eat many plants at all. So is it <laughs> is is it just based on um, what works best for your body or is there just like a, like a, maybe not a hard rule but a pretty hard rule about – what you should eat and how you should eat it and how your body responds to that. Because I know you're really big on lectins. That's something yeah. which I, I you're going to have to explain. Like I looked it up and I was trying to, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to so gather. Yeah, I was trying to gather what that was exactly on a molecular level. But I, I understood it a little bit. It, it's almost like uh, lectins go in and then they they basically alter how the cells function in a sense. Um, but yeah, if you can explain that a little better to me, that'd be awesome. Sure. Uh, well, believe it or not, plants, uh, don't want to be eaten. They were not put here on earth to eat us. Uh, they were here first and their predators like insects and us arrived later. And so plants, when they didn't have any predators, didn't have to worry about hiding or running or anything like that. So they just kind of stuck their feet in the ground. Um, and didn't move. So when animals arrived, uh, they had a problem because animals could eat them and they couldn't run. Mm-hmm. So they, but they're chemists you know, of incredible ability. You know, look out the window, they can turn sunlight into matter and we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So they use biologic warfare to make their predators think twice about eating them by making them ill. And one of their prime methods of doing this is to produce proteins, which are called lectins. Mm. Uh, some people think I'm saying lecithin, which is <laughs> emollient in chocolate. And mm. some people think I'm saying leptin. 
leptin, which is the anti-hunger hormone. No, it's <laughs> leptin. So lectins are what are called sticky proteins because they are looking for specific sugar molecules to stick to. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that those sugar molecules line the lining of our gut, they line the lining of our joints, they line the lining of our blood vessels, they line the space between nerves where nerves talk to each other. And that seems like, if you were a plant, really good targets to make mischief. And we now know that lectins, and uh, your listeners, I hope, uh, will recognize gluten. Yes. Gluten happens to be a lectin. Oh. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. actually why gluten is so mischievous. Mm -hmm. uh, but gluten is only one lectin. In fact, it's really not all that important in the scheme of things. Um, so <laughs> they, we know that lectins can attach to the wall of our gut and flip a switch and cause the lining of our gut to become leaky, literally. And when the lining of our gut is leaky, uh, about 70% of all the white blood cells in our body, our immune system, line the wall of our gut. And lectins are foreign proteins. And if your listeners remember a splinter under their skin, a splinter is a foreign protein and it gets all red and nasty and it mm -hmm. hurts. And that's our white blood cells attacking that splinter. So imagine that these things get through the wall of your gut and our immune system goes on high alert and begins to attack things. And that's actually the cause of inflammation. Mm -hmm. huh. And everybody's heard of inflammation and everybody wants to take anti-inflammatory stuff mm -hmm. like uh, turmeric, for instance, uh, curcumin. But the point is you won't have inflammation if you don't have a leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, 2,500 years ago, said that all disease begins in the gut. And boy, was he right. And he didn't have any research into the microbiome and all that. Uh, he just knew. And he was right. That's interesting. So that's the short course yeah. on lectins. And and so for for the normal, I guess the younger person, right? Mm -hmm. Because I feel yeah. like this happens over the course of time, right? When you're younger, you could, you probably heal faster and you can get through things easier and it doesn't affect you as much. So is it just a matter of when? Is that, is that how that goes? And when you get older and all, and all these things start really happening to you or you have to go to the doctor more often and take medication, is that all, I mean, or at least some of it stemming from this? It used to be like that. Um, and you're right. It used to be that, uh, as you figured out, uh, the object of the game is to uh, grow up, uh, have a baby, make sure the baby's okay or babies are okay, and then die and get out of the way. So uh, your kids have something to eat. And mm -hmm. we are designed to tolerate large amounts of insults for the purpose of reproducing. And after you're done with that, who cares about you? Um, so that used to be the way. But unfortunately, what I found in, in my new book, which will be out uh, in November, uh, called The Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, mm -hmm. I, I take care of a large number of kids uh, and young adults with autoimmune diseases, which never existed in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing uh, kids with rheumatoid arthritis, with Crohn's, with ulcerative colitis, oh, wow. eight, seven years old. And you go, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought, you know, when you're young, you kind of were immune to all this. Well, we've we've totally changed internal environment with the, the foods we eat. And just briefly, uh, we know that antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, not only help an infection, and you know, thank goodness we have them. But what we didn't know is that broad spectrum antibiotics kill. Every last living bacteria in our intestines, in our gut, mm -hmm. the microbiome, that actually is a major line of defense against lectins. And mm -hmm. they've been pretty much wiped out by antibiotics. Also, most of our animals, our cows, our pigs, our chickens, our uh, lamb, are fed antibiotics to make them grow faster. Mm -hmm. And 
So we, when we eat those things, we get those antibiotics as well. And lastly, almost all of the food we eat, all the grains that we eat have been sprayed with Roundup glyphosate. And what a lot of people don't know is that glyphosate is in almost everything, in all of our oat products. It's even the healthy, quote, ones. And glyphosate in and of itself is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, and glyphosate is capable all by itself of causing leaky gut. So what we thought uh, 50 years ago, uh, just what you said, that eh, you're young, you'll, 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 you'll be fine, uh, is not happening anymore. And, and that's why it's so important for young families and young adults to realize that, you know, it is, it's not your father's Buick. Well, you're <laughs> not your, fa- you're not your father's uh, gut microbiome. So, so uh, we've got to, we got to take care of things. Yeah. So we basically, it's almost like evolution in a sense, but like regression. <laughs> yeah, almost. No, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, I was, I was talking with, uh, you may know her wellness mama, uh, has another podcast. Um, wellness mama was, uh, was in her postnatal visit in her doctor pediatrician's office and, uh, was reading a magazine and it's, uh, basically said, this current generation will be the first generation that will have shorter lives than for the first time in in history. Oh, wow. wow. And, and, th- and that's true. Every projection now shows that uh, millennials uh, will live shorter lives than Gen Xers or the boomers. And holy cow, if that doesn't get your attention, yeah. I don't know what would. In fact, uh, right now, the last three years, our life expectancy has declined three years in a row. The first time that that has ever happened. And the first year it happened, everybody said, ah, that's a fluke. And now we're heading into our fourth year and we're going the wrong way. Ironically, I just started trying your super. This is Founders of your super are Michael and Crystal, which Michael got diagnosed with cancer. He was a very healthy, what was he, like a tennis player, Vic? Yeah, professional uh, tennis. Uh, actually, they were both professional okay. tennis players. And yeah. he got sick with cancer. And so she started to do these superfood mixes trying to help his immune system. Mm-hmm. And since it worked, she's trying to share it with the world, which is great. And strictly because, I mean, one of the main points is nine of 10 people don't get enough fruits and vegetables. So this is a way to really boost that for you. And like Dr. Gundry was talking about too it's like you don't know where this stuff is coming from well yeah. with this company they are 100 percent transparent with their supply chain you know what you're you know you're getting the cleanest superfood mixes on the market because it's telling you they're they tell you they're farmers etc you can research it it's very clean that's awesome um, and i started using the it's called forever beautiful organic superfood mix and it has chai seeds acai and some blueberries and other things in it so i literally just make my smoothie and i put this in there knowing i'm getting superfoods um and it tastes really great it makes it feel like a legit smoothie you know when you order it like a restaurant Mm -hmm. or something and you're like oh this is really clean like that's what it makes me feel like and what's awesome is that your super is a b corp certified which means they have the highest standard for social corporate responsibility committed to a bigger mission and for every mix you buy, they donate a life-saving food bar to someone in need. Wow. I, I love companies that give back. Yeah. So get this cleanest superfood and plant protein mixes at YourSuper.com. That's Y-O-U-R Super.com. Not to mention they have a lot of other things too, like green mixes and stuff for your immune system. Yep. Um, get 15% off your order when you use Coco, C-O-C-O at checkout. Yeah. Just go to YourSuper.com and don't forget to get 15% off with promo code COCO, C-O-C-O, at checkout. So, so Dr. Stephen Gundry, what am I to do? I can't eat the plants at the store. I can't eat right. the meat that has the antibiotics. I can't. I'm scared now. I'm, I'm going to end up starving myself. So should I, <laughs> should I grow a garden in my backyard, raise my own chickens? Like, what, What's the most... I guess practical way, practical way, feasible way to increase our life expectancy and just be healthy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, well, uh, let me give you a fascinating statistic from World War Two. Forty percent 
of all the food eaten during World War II, when, of course, there was rationing, came from backyard gardens, mm. 40%. Wow. And they, they were called victory gardens. Uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and believe it or not, we had a victory garden oh, wow. in, our, <laughs> in our yard. And when I was raising my kids um, in primarily Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, we had a victory mm. garden in the backyard, and we would go out and we would pull up a carrot and we would brush the carrot off. We wouldn't take it inside and wash it and scrub it and put it, antibacterials on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we would eat it. And what we now know is the more we eat things that are grown organically and the more we kind of pull them out of the ground and brush them off, the more we actually add healthy bacteria to our gut microbiome. Mm. And by the way, we were talking before we came on the air about dogs and playing Mm. with our dogs. It (laughs) turns out that people who have dogs have a much more diverse microbiome. And Mm. young families should know that if you have a dog or a cat, your kids will have a much healthier immune system. They will have far less asthma and eczema and rashes and allergies than if you didn't have a dog or a cat. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're learning more and more and more that we've got to uh, get back to nature in a way. So to answer your question, um, there's some wonderful human studies looking at kids and adults who are eating kind of the normal American diet, and then are put on an organic vegetable and pasture-raised meats and chickens for two weeks. And the amount of pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals in their bodies dramatically declines by about 70% in just two weeks. Oh, wow. wow. So, you know, we say, oh, gosh, you know, eating organic is so expensive. It turns out if, when you look at the long-term and even short-term consequences of changing to an organic diet, it actually pays for itself very quickly in better health. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, some major retailers now, like Walmart, and, you know, you can say a lot of bad things about them, but <laughs> for one thing, for one thing, they have now pretty much made organic produce uh, equal in price mm-hmm. to regular produce. Yep. And they're, they're demanding that their suppliers do this. And they're so huge that, you know, people mm-hmm. have to follow what they want. Yep. So, and I take care, uh, all, my, most of my practice is insurance-based. I even take uh, Medi-Cal and Medicaid patients, and they're able to do this, and they actually find they save money, which, um, so that's that. Now, in terms of whether you should eat plants or animals, uh, in The Longevity Paradox, my latest book, if you look at people uh, around the world who have the longest lives, as a general group of people, and these have been called the blue zones. Uh And I was a professor uh, at the only blue zone in America, Loma Linda, for most of my career. The thing that distinguishes blue zones is not that they eat grains and beans. They don't. Uh, They do, but that's not the major portion of their diet. It's that they eat very little animal protein. Hmm. And and that makes me cry because I grew up in <laughs> Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Omaha I'm, steaks, so, yeah. There you go, <laughs> Omaha steaks. Um, uh, so, and it makes me cry, you know, beef for breakfast, pork yeah. for lunch, and, you know, a side of beef for dinner. Mm-hmm. That's uh, me. <laughs> yeah. And the bad news is, and I go into this extensively in the book, that animal protein ages us rapidly. Dog. Gun it. Yeah. Um, <sighs> that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Now, does that mean you can't have it? No, that does not mean you can't have it. But try to buy grass fed, grass finished beef. Uh, try to buy pastured chicken. Uh, your listeners should realize that labeling laws have been gamed against us. For instance, the federal government passed a law in 2007 saying the definition of a free-range chicken 
is you can keep a hundred thousand chickens in a warehouse crammed in there never let them outside but open a door to the outside for five minutes every 24 hours and the chicken has the potential wow. to go outside and of course none of them would that's because terrible. they're all stuck and that's the definition of a free oh, range wow. chicken I, yeah. I, yeah i heard that that makes me so mad yeah that's yeah not- no it's a, it's federal law was actually introduced by a, a congressman from a chicken growing district. Uh, in of, Georgia. Cor- of course. Why does that oh. not surprise me? The lobbying yeah. behind that. Yeah. And the other thing is, there is no labeling law on what constitutes grass fed. And as a boy from Nebraska, I can tell you that all cows at some point in their life eat grass. Mm-hmm. But they are then, for the most part, taken to a feedlot and fattened up on corn and soybeans, which have been sprayed with Roundup. And you can label them grass-fed if, for one day, they ate grass. Wow. Oh, so, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what you got to do, you got to be a savvy consumer. And so you want to look for grass-fed, grass-finished. That means they never left the pasture Mm. Ah, and i was at whole foods actually last weekend here in santa barbara and they had four different ground beefs and three of them said grass fed and the next one said grass fed grass finished and so i talked to the butcher and i said so what you're telling me is uh those three that say grass fed were all finished on grains and soybeans. He said, Yeah, but nobody knows that. He said, You do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So would it would it be beneficial? I mean, it might even be profitable for an or an organization to be created for that specifically. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is the coalition or or uh uh you know, the grass fed, grass finished <laughs> Uh, you Without know, these are the companies, the right? You, you pay yeah. for the label and the stamp on your food because somebody goes and actually checks your facilities and X, Y, and Z, or do they have that already? Well, no, they don't have that already because the Department of Agriculture really doesn't want to sponsor that sort of uh, thing. Of course. We, we, sh- we should realize that the Department of Agriculture is not in the business of taking care of our health. They're in the business of selling agricultural products. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, you know, big food, big agriculture, uh, does a wonderful job of supporting our Congress and manipulating our Congress uh, to make sure that these things don't happen. But there are, you know, over and over again, more and more, particularly millennials and family farmers who have just gotten tired of this, have realized that you know, their their lives are being ruined and they're in the process of ruining other people's lives. I mean, there's a bunch of kids uh, south of Palm Springs in a town called Temecula who uh, I have no relationship with them except I'm very fond of them, have, have a farm. Uh, everything is pasture raised and it's called Primal Pastures and and they ship. There are other very good people. Uh, there's another one called Bel Campo Meats, where they have a farm at the base of Mount Shasta in Northern California, and they ship frozen uh, mm. all over the country. So you can find these places. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's people are starting to demand this, and the more we as individual consumers demand this, the more people will start producing this stuff because there is a profit to be made. And we we live in a small town of 800 people in Michigan. So yep. there are farmers that do sell their beef, but it's very expensive. And actually Victor buys it because it's a lot more organic than anything you can get in a store. And it tastes a lot better. Right, Victor? Yeah. Yeah. So, and also I was yeah. going to ask you about how do you feel about venison? So venison is actually pretty doggone good for you. Yeah. But... The savvy consumer should realize that most venison that you can buy at a store Mm -hmm. uh, is not wild, and it's been farm-raised and fed grain. Same with buffalo. Uh, Buffalo is is very in, but most buffalo is raised on farms and fed grains and soybeans, just like cows. So the best would be if, if, well, my brother and dad, they're hunters, so they 
get their venison. They take it locally. Sometimes they can it. That would be the best way to eat your venison is knowing you just shot the... Yeah. Shot yeah, it. And then, that, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, so, you know, uh, I, you know, my, uh, my, my, my dad was a hunter and, you know, I understand hunting. I don't hunt, but yeah, go, you know, if you're going, if yeah. you're going to eat, if you're going to eat an animal, you know, why don't you work for it? Yeah. That's how, yeah, that's, <laughs> right. yeah. That makes the most I mean, sense, honestly. Yeah, I they, mean, that's, that's what we did. All of us did up until a few generations ago. That's what I always preach to. I tell Victor, you're not supposed to eat meat every day. Back in the day, they would catch like an animal once in a while and they would celebrate and eat it, not eat it every day. No, I <laughs> And that's very true. Uh, people people don't realize, and my my major at Yale as an undergraduate was in human evolution, and we should realize that this myth that every day we were you know, killing a mastodon and feasting on it is mm-hmm. is not compatible with the archaeological record. We ate a lot of plants, mm-hmm. and because you know, not every day do you get a mastodon. Mm-hmm. And we also have to remember that there was really no way to store meat right. uh, for that matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could uh, occasionally smoke it, but that required having a smokehouse. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, this is a very new, this year-round meat every day is a new thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Long term, I think it's not a great idea, particularly if you look at long-lived civilizations, long-lived people. Right. Um, and so I was also going to ask you, you're, you're one of the few, and I, you know, there has to be other people out there, other doctors and, and such that, that really push for that preventative medicine. But is it really something that the health community as a whole is not pushing because of the money that they would lose from it? Because I always have this theory in the back of my mind that there are cures for uh, a lot of cancers. I don't know this. This is just me speculating. But then they're vaulted away somewhere because the money that they would lose from putting out cures to these things uh, because of all the treatments and, you know, thousands and, or actually would be billions of dollars that they make from this stuff. It's not beneficial for them to be like, all right, well, there is a cure for this. It's preventative medicine. You just have to do X, Y, and Z and you'll be all right. But we don't want to tell you that. Yeah. Well, Medical schools get most of their funding now and research uh, from drug companies. Mm-hmm. And uh, so doctors uh, are, are really taught that, okay, you know, here's a disease and we've got a, a pill for that or we've got a shot for that. And consumers, uh, almost all the ads on TV that you see every day are, you know, oh, you know, you have. Crohn's disease, no problem. You know, we now have, you know, 12 different pills. Choose the one you like yeah. and, you know, and you can have a happy life or, you know, oh, you have uh, heartburn. Well, you can take an Exium or Prilosec OTC and you can have a, you know, a spicy corn dog. Mm-hmm. And we're not told that, for instance, believe it or not, heartburn is caused by lectins. Oh. Uh, getting back to lectins. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so there there is more and more uh, awareness among doctors that there's got to be a better way. I I get third year family practice residents rotating through my clinic, and they've. It's interesting. They're in their last year of residency, and yet they've never been exposed to uh, what I call restorative medicine. Other people call it functional medicine, but the idea that. We should look at the body as a whole. We should look at the gut, the microbiome that lives in us, and that health is actually available to all of us. But getting back to your point, when they all say, oh, my gosh, you know, this is why I went into medicine. You know, I didn't know that we could actually do this. And they go back and they talk to their counselors. Oh, this is what I want to do. And their counselors say, no, you idiot. Um, You have to see patients every 10 to 15 minutes throughout the day. And to make a living, and you can't spend an hour with a patient and expect to survive. Mm-hmm. And they come back, and you know, actually, one woman was in tears, and she said, "You know, I've got two hundred thousand dollars in medical school bills that you know I have to pay, and 
you know, I, I guess I can't do this. And so it's, we're kind of gamed against us. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Do you think that's also because of the, like the way health insurance is set up? Uh, you have to check 55 million boxes and you can only treat X, Y, and Z this way. And so you're kind of put in a box and then you do have to have that, those many patients because of the way the insurance companies pay out and, and how they do it. Do you think that's one of the factors as well? Yeah, you're you're not paid to keep people healthy. You're not paid to keep people out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. You're actually paid for disease management. And it's interesting when we're filling out forms for these various lab tests that we get, uh, the only way you can get paid to even get labs for insurance is to have codes like, you know, a high cholesterol code or a pre-diabetes code or diabetes code or high blood pressure code. And if you don't, then insurance goes, well, we're not going to pay for these tests because you don't, you don't have anything. Mm. So the, the, the whole system is, is the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> insurance should say, I'm so glad you don't have any of these things and I'm going to pay large amounts of money to keep you that way. Yeah. Because, right? Because yeah. I don't yeah. want, you know, what we don't realize is the average adult American takes seven prescription drugs and thinks that's normal. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And, you know, we, we weren't born with a, with a Prilosec deficiency or mm-hmm. with a Lipitor de- deficiency or a Prozac deficiency. Um, these, are just, these are modern, you know, where did all this stuff come from? That's interesting. And so I guess getting back to, to your side of things, let's, uh, what, what recipes or what would, you, what would you recommend for kids to start eating or healthy habits or, or for families to get back on track, mm-hmm. right? Like, is there ever, and also, is there ever a point, like I guess you said at the beginning there was a man who you couldn't operate on and he ended up becoming like way healthier. So there is a way to, for everyone, can always get healthier. They haven't reached a point of, okay, well, I no ate return. bad. Yeah, I ate bad my whole childhood. I ate bad till I'm 20s, 30s, 40s, but then they can still have some type of reverse. Is that correct? Oh, oh, absolutely. And I, I have multiple examples in all my books about okay. people, even late in life. I, I'll give you a great example. that uh, Actually, she uh, concludes my uh, Plant Paradox book. Uh, she was 85 years old when I met her, and uh, she came to me because she had a daughter, and she was her only caregiver. And this woman had heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, hypertension, you name it. She had all the usual stuff. Mm-hmm. And she said, uh, I can't die. You've got to keep me alive because my daughter, I'm her, her only caregiver. And I'm right. not going to put her, put her in an institution. Keep me alive. So I said, okay, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do. Well, uh, this woman... Uh, lost uh, over 50 pounds, her diabetes went away, her wow. arthritis went away, her hypertension went away. She was a model as a young woman, and she became, she started dyeing her hair bright red again, mm-hmm. and she became this incredible cougar. And, <laughs> and she, I, I'm serious, and she started, you know, she started dating um, did you say she was eight? Did you say she was eighty five? Eighty five. Two years ago, we celebrated her tenth year anniversary at ninety five, wow. and she was with a seventy nine year old guy. I mean, having <laughs> wild times together, and and so you know, and she was she was you know just this and still is this young vibrant healthy woman mm-hmm. and it is never too late to make a change because your cells in your body are changed about 90% of them are recycled every 3 months now think about this so you're always going to build new cells and if you have high quality building materials mm-hmm. then the next time you build a new cell instead of you know duct tape and warp boards you're going to have healthy gleaming you know uh, it's kind of like this old house um, the bones are still good and you just rebuild on it yeah so it is never too late to make a change now having said that and particularly speaking to to young families, which, of course, the new cookbook addresses, Mm -hmm. 
the sooner you get your kids started on this path, the long better the long term benefit. As a as a children's heart surgeon, I can tell you that I see plaques in blood vessels in kids as young as eight or ten years old. Oh, wow. yeah, I mean, yeah. And uh, and that's just so this, from that's from their just diet. Just from the crap. Yeah, just from the you know. The other thing that's important to realize is our kids, you and me, did not come out of the womb craving Kraft macaroni and cheese and chicken McNuggets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, This is, we were taught this. Mm -hmm. Uh, A Japanese kid doesn't pop out of the box and say, wow, I love seaweed. Mm -hmm. Um, It's my, I have a, I have a five-year-old and three-year-old grandchildren and my, my one-year-old grandchild. Uh, much preferred broccoli over spareribs, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And he would just point to broccoli. And, you know, he, because uh, my daughter and son-in-law, you know, fed, you know, fed him this from day one. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, this is what I eat. Yeah. So the more you kind of foster these habits early on, and one of the things I really suggest to, to young parents is, Please, please, please get cereal out of the house, number one. Mm. Oh. Please, please, you know. It's all sugar, right? It's pure sugar. It's pure sugar and it's loaded with glyphosate, even the organic ones. Mm. Please do not give your children fruit juices. This is mainlining sugar. There's a recent paper out of England that shows that consumption of fruit juice prompts cancer. Oh, and gee. Oh. if you weren't aware, we are having an epidemic of childhood and te- teenage cancer, uh, which has never before happened. And you see all these heartbreaking commercials on TV for these children's mm-hmm. hospitals for cancer. We didn't have children's hospitals for cancer when I was in medical school because it was such a rare thing. And now it's it's epidemic. You know, it's all laid at the fact that all we're feeding our kids is sugar. And fruit sugar, fructose in juices, is the preferred fuel of cancer cells. Wow. So, you know. Fruit is, we need to think of fruit as nature's candy okay. because it, because it is candy mm-hmm. and we have to be careful with fruit. Interesting. I, I'm, you just blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like thinking, that's, oh gosh, when we have that, kids, I'm like, no, they're not having that, this or this. <laughs> yep. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> well, I, and I, I, I appreciate you so much uh, uh, for coming to talk with us. I know I could pick your brain for hours and hours. And you have your own podcast, correct? And you do have your own podcast. Yes. I do. The Dr. Gundry podcast and you can get it wherever podcasts uh, are available. Mm-hmm. Uh, my website, I have two websites, drgundry.com and gundrymd.com. I've got uh, two YouTube channels um, where I do recipes and all sorts of fun stuff. And again, four already New York Times bestselling books. And the new one, uh, The Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, will be out November 19th. And you can pre order it wherever books are sold, and you can find almost all my books in all the bookstores because they are New York Times bestsellers. I'm so. definitely yeah. grabbing the original first. I'm going to start there and I'm going to get... Work her way up. Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, work your way up. Yeah. So start with... So definitely you think start with the plant paradox first? Uh, yeah. But if somebody wants the quick and dirty cliff notes, uh, there's a paperback that uh, is also New York Times bestseller. The... Plant paradox, quick and easy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 need to have everything right there, fast and easy. That, that's the generation that we live in. So it, it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the big so, takeaway from here is food is the best medicine, mm-hmm. and that's absolutely right. If we if we do it that way, and we go by your principles and our general, you know, uh, I guess. Uh, Neanderthal principles, right? Because they, they were the ones that, that learned the body the best, I guess, in a sense. Uh, we'll, we'll be in a good place. Yeah, mm-hmm. Neanderthals, uh, many of us, uh, if you ever do a genetic or ancestry thing, will find that you do have some ans- uh, some uh, Neanderthal DNA in you, and that uh, mm-hmm. freaks some people out. But yeah, we... <laughs> uh, we uh, my... Uh, 
my daughter, who's an evangelical Christian, uh, has 3% Neanderthal DNA, which freaks her out. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's, she's come to grips with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Gundry. We really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, loved having you. Yeah, I learned so hey, much. Thanks for having me on. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get your books and, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Have a great weekend. You, you too. too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. That was definitely the most insightful podcast we ever had. I'm like wow. in shock, and I am going to literally buy that book, and I'm going to start, and I'm going to have my mom start. I mean, <laughs> it's just something at this age that I think about. My parents are 49 and 50, yeah. and I obviously want to be them to be 90 and maybe 70, and mm-hmm. just like hanging out and acting like we're you know 20 and 40. Especially when he was talking about that lady, 85 yeah. years old, and 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 having all those problems, mm-hmm. and it just flipped the switch from yeah. her just her diet. Right. So imagine what I mean. Just imagine we're eating this morning today. I had a piece of pizza for breakfast, and I had a freaking cookie. Okay, I don't do that all the time. No, let's I just don't say, either. but we did that. No, we did do we that. didn't. We don't do that all the time. I was juicing this past week <laughs> and I actually gained a pound after juicing. So I don't know how that happens, but I mean, also I was eating, I was just juicing in the morning and yeah. I'm trying to be healthier. Now I don't even know if those, uh, yeah. what I was using though is what I'm supposed juice. to be juicing with. And I've mm-hmm. been doing like fruit smoothies and it probably so much sugar. Yeah. Anyways, what was my thought process? Being healthier at oh, this just age. Imagine and- like, if I was fueling my body with stuff, I think that my food could be linked to some of my anxiety issues even because after we talked to the skin saint that one time, her husband, remember she said you can do that testing. Yeah, we and should like actually do that test. sometimes grains because I, I find that after I eat pasta, I get anxious. Which would be, it could be the lectins in there too uh, right, messing so with your body. One week I completely cut out carbs. I only made it five days, but I cut out carbs and I didn't have any anxiety. I don't know if that was because I was thinking about it. You know, there's just so many factors. I just think I could be such a better version of mm. myself, even on the on the inside. I'm more worried about than the outside, if that makes sense. I like the metaphor that he was saying, like regenerating our cells. Mm-hmm. It happens on a cycle. And so if you eat a bunch of bad stuff, you're regenerating your cells with bad stuff. Right. And then when you eat all the good stuff, you know, you're regenerating your cells with like high quality I feel like I'm so strict, though, that I would never eat out. I literally want to go start a garden right now, and it's fall. <laughs> I'm just like, I want to go back to the days. We don't have a Whole Foods, but I'm willing to drive hours. That's the thing. Like, if, if we had a Whole Foods, I mean, and there's always excuses, but, but what we we're saying is- But we can ship stuff to our house, and I'm going to figure out when we have kids, I'm making my own baby food, guaranteed, because there's just on the news, there's crap in the baby food. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to not give them fruit juice, not give them cereal, just like do what I can. Yeah, and and. I'm- all I'm saying is that it's an inconvenience to us in a sense being in this place because we don't have a Whole Foods or a place like that where we can get these things. But we do have a big backyard that we can grow a garden. We do have fresh – like if you want to buy your beef, we have people who – we yeah. see their cattle every day. They're out, man. They're free They're range. Grazing. They got yeah. miles to run and there's only four of them. Like that is something that we can get our hands on. For yeah. your health, where no, people don't really have that. We can have chickens in our backyard and they have space to run, you know? We could have chickens in our backyard. Well, and that's why we do want a, a farmhouse in a sense, but actually I wouldn't. I didn't ever want to eat the animals though. <laughs> like I won't, but I'm not going to go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I wouldn't either. I'd get too attached. Yeah. I mean, it's just how it is. It's just, you know what? Maybe you may be a plant-based diet soon. Uh, you never... I don't know. I don't, he is right though. I shouldn't eat as much meat as I do because I, I am that guy, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, and a side of it as well. So, um, but anyway, we're going to go into our Spanish word of the day. Okay. Okay. And it's obviously based on what we were talking about, kind of. Uh, so the Spanish word of the day is surujia. 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 Mm-hmm. Surujia. Surujia. I'm guessing it has something to do... It's not a surgeon, is it? Oh, uh, yes. It is? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it's... Yeah, I say surujia. 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 Oh, it, you say it wrong too, and I still got it. It's surgery. Yeah. <laughs> surgery. Cirugia. And if you 
eat better, you'll have less surgeries. Because a lot of people, they, you know, the artery clogs and all that stuff. And, and so. Yes, yes, Dr. Victor. Okay, so I always have told Victor. He missed his calling. He should have been a doctor. Why? He is very, very intelligent. One of the most intelligent. I didn't even know what a Neanderthal was. Okay, I was just <laughs> going with that conversation. And But anyways, he's very intelligent. He's very well-spoken. He makes decisions and he's okay with it. The reason I couldn't be a doctor is not because I'm not intelligent or my drive. I have a lot of drive, but I'm not as intelligent. Anyways, I have to work for it. Victor is naturally intelligent. You're so kind. And he makes decisions and he's okay with it. Where I am, like, I go back and forth, like, oh, mm-hmm. I mean, did I do the right thing? Victor's like, this is the best decision. We're going to go forward with it. And that's something that a doctor needs to have is, like, being able to make decisions. Yeah. Fast, easy, with all the... Yeah, being able to take in all the available information, mm-hmm. make a sound decision, and just own it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, anyways, he must I have call thought me. about that. And the more you say it, the more I get frustrated with myself. But you know what I have been thinking lately? Because you, ner- you were nerdy in school. I don't know why you never, I don't know why you didn't go from that from the beginning. You have a friend that's going to be a doctor or is yeah, a doctor. Uh, yeah, shout out to so uh, right Fortunato now, Padua. Right now, you would be done. And yes, you'd have lots of, like he said, tons of bills to pay. I mean, who knows if you'd ever recover, but you'd be changing and helping so many lives. And I'd feel very comfortable being married (laughs) to a doctor because I'd be like, am I having a heart attack? You know what I have thought? And I've thought about this lately and I haven't even told you about this. Mm -hmm. I thought that I could start taking, and I didn't know, and I still have to look it up. I don't know if there's any online classes you could take or you have to actually go to a campus, but starting for undergrad medical school? No, 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 no. Oh. Slowly starting uh, to a law degree to be a, a lawyer. That's something else you'd be great at. You, yeah. although I do win ninety nine percent of the arguments. No, but I okay. I disagree. I let you win arguments sometimes because I argue fact. When you argue opinion. No, I don't argue opinion. I come with evidence and I come hard. I, you do not beat me in arguments. I, I do though. No, you don't. Okay. See, and then this is when I regress and I say, no, you're right. Just for the no, sake you never of say the I'm argument. Right. You never say I'm right. Maybe right now on the I podcast say, you say I say I'm I right. agree to disagree and I leave it at that. I, I stop arguing the point because it's not worth it. I tell you when you got me. Well, the difficult is if you're, so do you, uh, so a dogmatic person. Right. So if you're going into an argument unwilling to change your opinion, even when you're confronted with evidence about said opinion, then... No, I can be swayed. You, you can't. A lot of times you can't, though. Depends if it's from experience. If I have experience in something or have seen experience and I have that as evidence, then no. But say like I'm watching a show on TV and someone killed someone and I'm like, oh, there's no way they did it. Like the staircase or whatever... I mean, I th- I got swayed in thinking he's freaking innocent. And everyone's like he's freaking guilty. So it's like, yeah, that's a hard one. That was a good. Be, if you guys haven't seen that, I can uh, the be staircase swayed by yeah. I guess people's feelings. I feel sorry for them. So me, okay, whatever. You'd be saying, a great lawyer, but you need to start winning more arguments against me. In well, the, the thing is, I don't. I don't do when when I'm trying to fight an argument. I don't put emotions. It's not an emotional based argument. A lot of times. It's emotion based. Okay, so for for example, the arguments we would have sometimes would be you shouldn't eat meat because back in the day we were cavemen and we would hunt, and you'd be like, well, your argument, you would lose that argument. But you wouldn't admit that you lost that argument. You'd say, well, no, now we I, have I, all of the stuff. So I agree with you, but that wasn't even an argument. I understand where you're coming from. But it doesn't change your opinion or how you eat or how you feel. No, because even with I all like the eating, evidence Because given. I like eating meat. That's, that's different. But I'm talking about straight, like, legit arguments about things. And I can't okay, even think like of one right leasing, now. Leasing, so weird or normal. Leasing okay, yeah, a car well, versus buying a car. We'll hop into weird or normal. I but this think, is not arguing, though. I don't think anybody should No, it's should a debate. A it's a debate. Okay, so the weird, so we're jumping into the weirder normal if you didn't catch that right now. And it's leasing a car versus buying a car. So go ahead with your argument. I think leasing a car is silly because I think you're paying rent on a car that you're never going to own. You're limited on miles. And if you need that new car every two years, then so be it. Mm-hmm. That's, I guess, the only benefit, but you're never going to own a car. 
You're never going to be like, wow, this is paid off. This is mine. I can do what I want yeah. with it. I don't have payments for X amount of time. You're living your whole life with payments. I mean, as far as I know how leasing works. I agree. No, no. And I agree with you. There is no argument between I'm not between really you and educated in the leasing aspect. But I when know they, they ask- do have like lease to buy, but I don't know the parameters that yeah. are for that. But I do agree with you. If you're going to be spending that money month by month anyway, I think it also depends on the type of person you are, right? Yeah. So let's say you don't drive a lot as it is. Right, and you can have regular maintenance on your vehicle, and you're not going to go over the miles because you know that, and so you can just keep the payments and then keep getting a new car. You know what I mean? I, I just but don't see it. I don't. I don't either because I don't want to be limited on what I can do with my. Like, vehicle. say you want to take up and drive to Florida. It's like, oh, we can't because we'll yeah. go over miles. Da, da, yeah, da, da, da. exactly, exactly. I don't know. I just. I also think paying rent is silly. That's why I bought a bought a house. I was mm-hmm. just like, I'm gonna buy a house because if I'm sitting there paying rent and rent and rent, and then I'm like, oh, five years. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have just. Yeah. Now I. Can't, I and can't pay all that money back, get that money back and put it towards a house. I can agree. But in a city and stuff, exactly. could it, yes, it can be different because maybe that's all like, well, I mean, some cities are so expensive. You can only, I could only afford That would be rent. my only argument to that. Yeah, that is a good argument. Because, But if you yeah. have the option to buy, I'm just saying if you have the option to buy versus lease, mm-hmm. because most rental places is more expensive than a mortgage payment on a house yeah yeah yeah. so that's what i'm saying where we live that's how it would be your rent payment would be the same as your mortgage yeah so the and it's just it's a matter of everything that goes into it right the type of life that you live if you're in a job that makes you move a lot and and, you know so there's a lot of things that go into it but generally in a city you're not going to buy an apartment complex or you're not going to buy a condo you know what i mean because that ends up being more expensive a lot of times than a house anyway in the in the suburbs you know, so I can see in the city I mean, why I people can see wouldn't buy it. I, no, I get that too. Mm-hmm. I just think like it's crazy how much money people waste without yep. knowing they're wasting yep. it. Yep, hundred percent. That's that's the only thing is because I am a person that's like kind of cheap when it comes to that. Where I can't just when I paid rent for college, I was yeah. like, this is terrible. Like it was only five hundred dollars. I lived in a, the nicest place that you could live in Saginaw and I still would like, Oh, mm-hmm. like, and that was a cheap rent. Cause I hear other people's rents and it's like thousands seven, of dollars. A thousand. I'm just like, Oh my gosh. I was thinking I could have just, I don't know. I mean, that was a lot of money to me. No. And the thing is you're, uh, the way so people are raised different. Mm-hmm. You're raised in an area where we're fortunate enough to be able to buy a house at a good price because land is cheap around here, and the cost of living itself mm-hmm. is cheap around here. You know, yeah, I, my house probably costs as much as someone's yearly rent in California. Oh, way, way, not way less. That's insane. Way less. Yeah, but it's but it's because California is a really nice place to yeah, live. You're, you're talking about like two grand. Uh, two grand a month or more, maybe, and and over a hundred, you know, thirty thousand dollars a year, maybe. <laughs> that's insane yeah. to me. But I mean, if you can afford that, that's awesome because that's something that I just couldn't afford. I guess yeah. it's all based on what you can afford and what you want. It's all different. But when it comes to like me trying to teach, say, my kids something, mm-hmm. I just want to install what I was what was in my brain. I guess because I feel like I I'm okay. No, you're right, and and that's why I don't it's think good money is just like frivolous. I don't think like you know. Mm-hmm. No, you're absolutely right. You're yeah. absolutely right, and that's what I mean. Like we're you're fortunate enough to be have grown up in this place, so you know what this is. Not growing up in the city and then never knowing what this is over here and just being used to the city life and like, oh, I can never not live in the city. Like planning our wedding, bringing it back to that in the city, people. I mean, I told them our budget and I got laughed at because, Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking- The original budget. (laughs) Like I said, 40,000 was our original budget and they chuckled and said, there's no way- Was it 40 or 30? I told them 35 to 40, but they literally chuckled at me. For the amount of people. For the 300 people, whatever. And I was just kind of like- Okay, because I was like, "Holy crap!" Like, <laughs> and people do that. But to be clear, yeah. in our area, people, people do it for less. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars is exactly. a wedding. You can have a very nice wedding in our area for twenty thousand dollars for three hundred guests. Mm-hmm. So I guess I was just kind of like already thinking it was high, and so now it's like, Yeesh. okay, yeah, it's going to be way worse than that. But it's just it's just a different mindset, a different price on things, a different. Yeah. 
I don't know. It's, it's crazy. The cost of living is drastically different. <laughs> yes. And we went on a tangent, but I hope, okay. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And now we're going to move into our reviews. Okay. Because we care about you guys so much. We really appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll take it away. Wow. Can you say binge? <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Allison Cotter. I think uh, that's how you say her last name. If I mess it up, I'm sorry. Nicole and Victor are my new best friends I've never met. I'm serious. I watch Big Brother religiously, and Nicole is and always will be one of my favorite players. I was Aww. never one to listen to podcasts, but I finally looped in after watching, re-watching BB16 and The Amazing Race, and holy cow. These two have a way of making you feel like you're just chilling and having a conversation with your best friends. I started listening from the beginning in the uh, the first week in June, and I was all caught up two weeks later. It's painful to have to wait to hear the latest segments, but when the episodes finally come out, it is a highlight of my commute. I recommend this podcast to all my friends, even if they don't watch BB, because Nick and Vic are that awesome and relatable. Thanks for being so incredibly yourselves and giving me a guaranteed weekly laugh until I cry moment during weird or normal your neighbor in wisconsin allison oh that's so sweet it was long but it's it was really worth good it. <laughs> okay this one's called favorite part of the week five stars by xx beach chic chick chick <laughs> I, I, I just chic i just le- recently learned how to spell chic <laughs> and so it's with why. a ch yeah, yeah. You're right. okay five xx my husband has been into podcasts for years but i have never found one interesting enough that i wanted to listen to every week um, until I listened to Coco Caliente. Aww. Now I wait all week for a new episode to drop and I am hooked. Nicole is my favorite BB player ever. Sorry, Vic. Uh, okay, and I love course. their chemistry on The Amazing Race. I'm a huge reality TV fan, so I love hearing all the interviews and their hot takes on the shows too. Such an encouragement that they are living such a humble, down-to-earth life and I feel like I genuinely know them as people from listening to them each week. So inspired by you both, Nick and Vic for Life Heart. Oh, thank you. That was really sweet. That was. You guys really do uh, keep us rolling forward. And Nicole, where are we on the new uh, merchandise? Um, it was three weeks, like a week ago. It took a while for us to get the proofs to a. Um, oh, okay. Just, so it's still um, a couple more weeks, probably. We got the mugs in, but I want to release everything at once. Okay. Just giving our listeners an update on that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, the easiest way to do that is on the little purple app on your phone, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can listen to this podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, mm-hmm. Spotify, and you can always listen and buy our merchandise at www.cococalientepodcast.com. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Coco Caliente Podcast and on Twitter at Coco Caliente Pod. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.